needs for question and answer. Uh, and then if you, you want me to give you a head, head up or you are fine? Yeah, okay. 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 Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jasveer. I'm going to present on higher education at the crossroads, what it takes to lead in an era of disruption. Okay. <clears throat> This is the era of the Industrial Revolution, an era where disruptive technologies reign. Challenges within higher education have come to the crossroads due to disruptive technologies, 21st century skills, globalization, and global competition. Thus, higher education needs to be redeveloped to improve the educational system in the era of disruption. The method used in this research is qualitative method, which consists of the study of literature of the field. The purpose of this research is to identify and analyze the disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence and virtual reality that are challenging education and to rethink the way to design education products, satisfy customers and generate revenue for higher education to reap bottom line benefits. To reinvent higher education, this research suggests that the management and the educators at higher education embrace a culture that promotes constant transformation, invest in manpower that will play a strategic role in managing disruption and design workspaces that inspire creativity for the educators and the students as well as lead their innovation. This research will incorporate the triple bottom line theory introduced by John Elkington in 1994 to measure performance. His idea was to promote sustainability as well as get, gain profits from business ventures. Higher education is to be viewed as a business venture and its human capital, manpower and students need to be sustained in a sustainable environment. It will outline how we, would, we should manage and utilize disruptive technologies against human capital to reap benefits at higher education and achieve bottom line benefits. This research will incorporate the triple bottom line theory introduced by John Elkinton in 1994. The idea is that he promoted was sustainability as well as gain profits from, from business ventures. Triple bottom line theory believes that the social and the environment are as important as profits are. Profit, people, and the planet. TBL postulates a corporation's commitment towards society and its impact on the environment. It argues that if a company only concentrates on profits by ignoring humans and the planet, it will not earn as much as it can if it uses the triple bottom line concept. In business term, triple bottom, li bottom line means profits. TBL can easily be interpreted as people plus planet equals to social plus environmental responsibility. It argues that companies should work on three aspects simultaneously, profit, people, and planet. Major challenges, uh, there are challenges of applying the triple bottom line and measuring the TBL to a company. The major challenge is measuring the social and, envir and the environmental bottom lines. Profits are easy to measure because they involve figures and are quantitative. Social and environmental responsibilities are subjective. So a business has to maximize financial returns without mixing inverse elements. TBL advocates this philosophy. So there has to be a balance between the three TBL elements. If TBL is ignored, profits might suffer. Consumers might choose companies that respect the climate and manpower. The example of companies that use TBL and respect um, the environment and manpower are like Exxon, Ben & Jerry, the Lego Group, Mars, Starbucks Corporation. And TBL is based on the stakeholders theory, according to Graham Hubert. TBL Hubert states that TBL emerged in 1997 as a new tool to measure performance. It was created in 94. It became active in 97. Okay, this is what this is a table that Hubert has created. Okay, for us. 
So he explains uh, it as this is economy, environment, society, and then uh, companies normally they emit chemicals and residues. So he looks at uh, something that is called BSC. Okay, according to him, according to him, okay. BSC is balanced scorecard. Okay, BSC is com when combined with TBL is a matrix that can be used for a comprehensive and detailed evaluation since it involves the TBL. Thus, there is a correlation between the TBL and BSC. Both are performance indicators. There, there are models that can be used for sustainability assessments to improve an organization's performance and sustainability. Hubert's model is appropriate to be used in higher education for us to lead in the era of disruption. It is easier to use this model on higher education because unlike most fields or firms, higher education does not create harmful byproducts or residues like waste, air emission, or chemical residues like other companies do. So a university that represents higher education supplies human capital to the industry. Thus, higher education emits the least waste and residue. Human cap the human capital produced by higher education are easily transferable. Higher education does not only produce human capital, it produces research too. The research that a university produces too is most of the time easily transferable in industry like human capital is. Normally one research can be used in many fields and this involves multitasking at which a university's research group is expert at. TBL is a good model for measurement of achievement and for production. However, TBL has its weaknesses and limitations. The inability to measure and track social environment, environmental performance in a meaningful, consistent and comparable way is one of the weaknesses and limitations. That is why the above model that has been created by Hubert by blending TBL and BSC helps in solving the problem that has been mentioned by power that is present in TBL. There are certain tensions that arise in organizations that TBL is equipped to solve. One of them is labeled as belonging tensions. These tensions refer to identity issues and the need to appease multiple stakeholders, the stakeholders in a company or at higher education. Okay, So we have to have um, strategies and goals in order to appease these uh, multiple stakeholders. There are also paradoxical tensions. These are unique to TBL firms. Firms that practice TBL have to accept the fact that paradoxical tensions exist and they have to learn to understand and accept them. The advantage of the paradox lens is that it provides opportunities for innovation because the lens highlights opportunities to manage paradoxes across the TBL. This lens accepts low performance on lower priority goals. This is the era of the industrial revolution, an era where disruptive technologies reign. Challenges within higher education have come to the crossroads due to disruptive technologies, 21st century skills, globalization, and global competition. What are these and how are they connected to each other? Disruptive technologies produce products such as the internet. This is one example. The products based on the disruptive technology initially only satisfy a niche market segment, which values dimensions of performance on which the disruptive technology does excel. Over time, as research and development investments are made and the technology matures, the performance supplied by the disruptive technology improves to the point where it also can satisfy the requirements of the mainstream market. Incumbent firms that focus on R&D attention on improvements to existing technologies, sustaining technologies, have a hard time catching up with 
the lead of the entrants that emerge based on the disruptive technologies. Therefore, disruptive technologies tend to be associated with the replacement of incumbents by entrants. The internet initially was only for a niche market, it was used by academicians mostly and by youngsters. Today, the market has expanded. This technology caught up and took over incumbents like the post office and the telephone, which initially were a niche market. Okay? The internet introduced to the world and the field of communication technology a dimension of performance that was unimaginable. So, okay, this is a graph by Ken Key, okay? And it discusses 21st century skills, why they matter and what they are and how we get there. And he connects it to learning, to education. We, as opposed to other definitions, he states that he defines 21st century skills. We aren't rigid about the language used to describe 21st century skills. Either we say adaptability, for instance, while others prefer resiliency. We say critical thinking, others say systems thinking. No matter, we are all talking about the same concepts. On the other hand, the term 21st century skills is not a vague and squishy catchword that can mean anything. Thus, the model of the skills that he introduces have to be put forward as relevant for many purposes and fields. Okay. Okay. And it has been created by a team of people from many fields and can be applied to education and business. Therefore, higher education can use this model to enhance its niche in the business arena in the 21st century, since higher education has always been a commodity to the field of education and the nation. 21st century skills cannot survive without globalization. The idea that the world is becoming a single space is important in higher education. We have faced tremendous challenges during the era of COVID-19 since 2020. Higher education had to become the testing ground for education. Without disruptive technologies, higher education, the business world and humanity in general would never have survived the problem created by the killer pandemic that has caused millions of deaths worldwide. The world indeed became a single space. There has been rapid growth with the help of disruptive technologies and globalization in the medical field especially. To combat the virus, higher education and the medical field worked hand in hand and have benefited in these trying times from disruptive technologies. We managed to find a vaccine in record time. This hope that the disruptive technologies that we use at higher education and research as well as in medicine will help us solve the other medical problems and innovate higher education. A composite efficiency therefore might be that globalization is an accelerating set of processes and I can't, I have to pull this up. That encompass ever greater numbers of the world spaces that lead to increasing integration and interconnectivity among those spaces. Globalization seems ephemeral because technologies like the internet are beyond an average man's normal thinking capability. Thus, it is difficult to comprehend the power of globalization and to handle it. However, due to the emergencies created by COVID-19, the world has had to grapple with globalization and use disruptive technologies to master it. And thus far, it has helped us handle the pandemic and save millions of lives. There are inequalities within higher education that need to be addressed. The tool to measure these inequalities is TBL with the help of BSc. Higher education cannot be handled like the state is handled. It has to be broken into a smaller entity than the state or the nation state and be measured as a distinct unit. Higher education then has to be broken down to smaller entities, i.e. the universities that exist in this country these then will have to be separated into public universities and private universities before TBL and BSc is employed on them to enhance productivity with the use of disruptive technologies. 
disruptive technologies have triggered a paradigm shift. The shift is from higher education to globalization. However, it becomes local, thus the emphasis is on both a local education system and a globalized education system. Malaysian higher education has to work on the practice of reflecting or characterizing education with both local and global considerations. In order to understand globalization better, we have to discuss global competition. Mark Ginson argues higher education is now situated in an open information environment in which national borders are routinely crossed and identities are continually made and self-made in encounters with diverse others. Higher education is seen by him as a complex system, a flow of networks and ideas at a global level. The national education system is shaped by the systems in a country as well as finances and institutions function at three levels, the local, the national and the global. Cooperations and competition structure and influence relationships between higher education institutes and countries as well as governments. Higher education is competitive and has hierarchy, especially hierarchy of power. It is controlled by certain rules and regulations. Thus, in the era of disruptive technologies, it is important for us to employ regulators like TBL and BSC to help manage and discipline as well as help higher education to produce and run more effectively without going out of bounds or being derailed from the mission of education and the policies that have been implemented. The dynamics of higher education have to be explored with national competition and global competition in view. What kind of goods does higher education offer to the market? This is a relevant and most pertinent question to ask when we use TBL as a tool to promote higher education and BSC as a measure, as a measuring tool. How do we maximize productivity with the help of TBL and BSC at national and global level and remain competitive at both levels? to attract as much revenue as possible into our universities? This is another question that needs to be confronted. Our research cap capacity controls our performance at higher education. We should use this expertise to the maximum level to solve problems in higher education with the help of TBL and BSc. What dominates higher education in the Western markets, i.e. the United Kingdom and the United States, as well as English as a lingua franca? This is argued and discussed by Marginson in detail. Thus, higher education has to have a comprehensiveness in its research universities and should be framed by teaching research nexus that should integrate the mission of the university. Global higher education exists within the practice of a worldwide university hierarchy that is within higher education globally and between nations. What is important in higher education is not only disruptive technologies, but also human capital. Without human capital, a university will cease to exist. The most important human capital are the educators in an institution followed by the students. There will not be enough student enrollment or enough research produced by a university without the existence of good educators and researchers. By good, it is meant well-educated and well-trained lecturers and researchers. Only then higher education will have a niche and be competitive at any level and lead. Thus, higher education needs to be redeveloped to improve the educational system in the era of disruption. The method used in this research is qualitative method, which consists of the study and analysis of literature of the field. The purpose of this research has been to identify and analyze the disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence. Okay. That and generally, I have stated it as the internet, that are challenging education and to rethink the way to design education products, satisfy customers and generate revenue for higher education to reap bottom line benefits in order to lead. To reinvent higher education, this research suggests that the management and the educators at higher education embrace a culture that promotes constant transformation, invest in manpower that will play a strategic role in managing disruption and design workspaces that inspire creativity for the educators and the students as well as lead their innovation. This research has incorporated the TBL theory introduced by John Elkington in 1994 to measure performance. His idea was to promote sustainability as well as gain profits from business ventures, which higher education should aim to benefit from. 
higher education is to be viewed as a business venture and its human capital, manpower, and students need to be sustained in a sustainable environment. This essay has outlined how we should manage and utilize disruptive technologies against human capital to reap benefits at higher education and achieve bottom line benefits. There's also included ideas on how organizational performance should be measured by the use of BSC for the purpose of reaping maximum revenues from the market and the human capital in order to lead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Halima, spot okay. on. Um, any questions for Dr. Halima from the members of the floor? So you can unmute yourself or you can write your question in the chat box. Has this paper been uh, published, Dr. Halima? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yes, I'm still working on it. All right. So it, you did it. It is, um, I left this field of uh, education, doing research on education about 20 years ago and uh, management and business. Because I'm trained in both. Okay. Okay, my PhD is in literature, but Basically, I did education and public relations. Okay, all right, all right. And you did a systematic literature review, I, I presume? Yeah, a systematic literature review. Mm -hmm. I need to go through it again and add on some of the things, I think. All right, okay. okay. What, what do you think that you want to add? I don't know, a little bit more research or a little bit more explanation on the frameworks. Mm. Because I think this is this is quite good, but most probably it's too simple. So I need to go through it again. I think simple is more like, you know, if you keep it simple, then at least, you know, um, other academics can understand your can point understand. of view. Mm. Yeah. I always believe but, in simplicity. You no, know, to me it might look simple because my base is that. My base mm. is business. Okay, so it might look simple to me and, and mm. not to all of you. <laughs> so any questions? Yeah, any questions? Can we leave it as it is? And if they have any questions, then I can direct that to you once we finish the second or the third speaker. Is that okay, Dr. Halima? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Halima, okay. um, for presenting your work. And can we go to the next presenter? So Dr. Halima, if you can uh, uh, off sharing your screen, then the next presenter can share um, their screen. Okay. Yes. Sorry, stop sharing. Yep. Okay. So yes. the next presenter is Mr. Heng. I presume you are here. And if you can um, put on um, switch on your video and uh, unmute yourself. Yes, Hello. Mr. Heng. Hello. <laughs> okay, so Ms. Sang-Hang is going to present on the mediating role of institutional factor on relationship between technology acceptance model and student satisfaction to use e-learning during COVID-19 pandemic, the study of a private university in Malaysia. So Mr. Hang, you have about 20 minutes to present and then about five to 10 minutes of question and answer. All right, thank you. Over to you. So I'll just put my hand five minutes. If it is uh, five minutes left, I'll just put my hand or I'll just uh, and also direct message you as well. Okay, thank you. Miss. Thank you. Okay. Over to you. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. So today I am representing 
my team uh, to present our paper uh, with title The Mediating Roles of Institutional Factors on the Relationship in Between Technology Acceptance Models, TAM, and also with the student satisfaction when they are using e-learning during this uh, COVID pandemic period. So this study we are done uh, across the private university in Malaysia. And my name is Mr. Heng, Mr. Heng Hancock. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to give some introduction on my on our study. So as as we know, education plays a virtual role in the development country like Malaysia. Okay, but COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, make our the whole economic system like totally in the e-learning mode right so but i got heard some of the students that they are facing some learning anxiety okay not all of the students can accept that, uh, this kind of learning mode okay so our study is intent to anal analyze the interaction in between the satisfaction of student, of our university student, and the, we, we want to find out whether the, there is a relationship in between the, their satisfaction with TAM components. So we are focused on perceived usefulness and also perceived ease of use from TAM model, okay? Apart from that, we also like to adding, okay? We want to test the mediating roles uh, for institutional factors, okay? Whether got affected or whether mediate, mediate, got any mediate effect on these two component relationships. So this is this these are my two main research objectives. The first one is I want to we want to determine determine the influence of technology acceptance model on student satisfaction towards their e-learning in higher learning institution in Malaysia. Okay, and then the second objective is to test like what I mentioned just now to test the mediating model considering institution, institutional factor as boundary condition for input factor, which are associated with student satisfaction toward e-learning to enable inter and intra-group relationship among student and education institution. So for literature review part, we got gone through a lot of Journal that related to institutional factors. So our focus is more on uh, facilitating condition, information of information and also cost content quality for this study. Okay, because institutional factors got a lot, but we are focused on these three: facilitating condition information and also cost content the quality of cost content so information quality iq is one of the most important element okay according to alam study and also with other past researcher and electron researcher electronic learning has proposed that information quality has a significant relationship in between information quality, behavior intention, and previous uh, perceived usefulness, perceived is of use, and also the user satisfaction, according to Muhammadi, Amin, and Alam. Okay, according to their research. And then we still got some of the 
literature review that related to facilitating condition. Okay, the first one is Paul. Paul mentioned that the facilitating condition is referred to individual perception of technical and organization, organizational infra, infrastructure, which is important in order to use and support the system. So in the context of this study, it referred to the external factors such as infrastructure and also resources that influence the intentions of user to use the e-learning technology. And then when Kertes also pointed out that there is a strong relationship between facilitating condition and satisfaction to use and adoption of technology. And one more study is from Midvi and Rishomo conducted that their study from 823 students and then they get the result that the facilitating condition had significant positive effect on student mobile learning, learning satisfaction. And other than facilitating condition, we also got gone through few literature review about precept ease of use and precept usefulness that, uh, that related to satisfaction of students. So this, this study is about the, the relationship in between perceived usefulness and satisfaction. And they found that the, there is a positive consideration about the usefulness of online parenting resources positively related towards employ the online technology. And we also got a lot of number of study found that create e-learning acceptance and satisfaction, the learning content and the e-learning system must be well maintained and up to date. Okay. Then this is our study framework. So basic, basically, we are focused on two variables or Two, el two elements from time model, which is perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. And we want to, we want to test the uh, relationship with the e-learning satisfaction of student. And the second, second one is based on our research objective, which is we put at, we add on with the mediation factors, which is institu institutional factors. And here are my research hypotheses. The first, the first hypothesis is about perceived ease of use, a positive effect, effect on student e-learning satisfaction during COVID-19 MCO period. And the second one is perceived usefulness, a positive effect on student e-learning satisfaction during COVID-19 MCO period. And the third one is about the mediating factors, which is institution factors. The hypothesis is this factor uh, mediate the relationship between perceived ease of use and student e-learning satisfaction. And the last one, the last hypothesis is institutional factor mediate the relationship between perceived usefulness and student e-learning uh, satisfaction. And our research methods is more on quantitative. And our survey is by using Google Form. 344 set of questionnaire were collected. And TAM is our main instrument for our questionnaire, which contain 20 items which, which affect satisfaction of students in e-learning. So all, all the questionnaire are formed by using Likert skills from five strongly agree to one strongly disagree. 
and our data are analyzed by using software of SPSS. So this is the, the analysis that we gone through, reliability analysis, and all of the items that we use are the Combrox alpha value are more than 0 0.7, so it's considered higher. And our internal reliability of questionnaire are achieved. And we also gone through the validity test by using KMO and ballot test. And it's also so that this is a significant, significant, and that means our questionnaire are achieve the validity level. And then for our result and discussion, as you can see, all of, all of our hypotheses are supported and all part of coefficient are significant at alpha 0 0.05. And because of the T statistic is greater than the value from T table, those indicates that perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use has a significant positive effect on SS mean, SS stand for satisfaction of student. Okay, so sorry that I put SS. SS means uh, satisfaction of student and perceived usefulness and also perceived ease of use has a significant positive effect on institutional factor. And institu institutional factor has a significant effect on satisfaction of students. So if you go through the path of perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use to satisfaction of students, you can find that there, are, there is a positive coefficient of 0 0.29 and 0 0.3847, and they are significant at 0 0.05 alpha levels. And this indicate that if there is a better perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use, then the satisfaction of students is more higher. And our analysis of mediation, actually we gone through two steps. The first part we are, we are analysis without, without the mediator. And the second part we are go through together with the mediator. So after introducing the institutional factor as mediator, all path have a positive coefficient and significant. That means all criteria of mediation and this criteria, criteria were completed. So based on the result, it can be concluded that institutional factor is partially mediate between variable from time order and student satisfaction. So that means institutional factor has an important role as a mediator in relationship between thesis usefulness and also thesis ease of use with the student satisfaction. So this is also the outcome or the result that we get from the with uh, mediator analysis. So this is in between the, the, media, the, the mediation factors that affected the relationship in between perceived usefulness and satisfaction of students. And another result that I show on the screen is the institutional factor act as mediation in between relationship with PU, PEU, perceived ease of use and satisfaction of students. So for our conclusion is that the result of study revealed that perceived ease of use, perceived usefulness and institutional factor are the among factor that address satisfaction of e-learning. And this finding also show that the better 
perceive usefulness and perceive ease of use will increase learning ability, ability of students with institutional factors, which is fact facilitating condition, information quality, and also content quality. And this one will directly motivate our student uh, to, and then they will more satisfied across their e-learning process. So furthermore, this indicate that the management of university in Malaysia, not only private, but also local, should always give the best service quality in terms of institutional factors to increase student satisfaction and directly, directly push the intention of students to use e-learning in the future. Uh, last but not least, we got some recommendation for future studies. So for future study, it is proposed that maybe we can reanalyze the model into local university because what, what we are doing now is on private uni university. Okay. So from there, maybe we can we can see whether this model are uh, books are uh, works on local uni university or not. And then we, you, we also for future, future study, we also can do some comparative research, which we can compare in between Malaysia student and other country students on their satisfaction in their e-learning process by using this model. So by doing so, maybe our researcher can discover more factors, not only these, these three, right, that could influence e-learning satisfaction of students in developed countries. So this is uh, what I'm, I'm need, I want to show you the, our, our result and also our analysis on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hang. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well on time. Um, any questions for Mr. Hang? From the members of the floor? You are welcome to give some, maybe some suggestion or some idea to which can improve or we can do better on this. Has this been? Uh, Hi. Hi, Hi, Dr. Nick. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I have one uh, very short question. Um, do, do you also look at gender? Uh, do you also compare gender on this on this in this research? Thank you. Oh, we, we are not we are not maybe maybe after this we can because this paper haven't published. Uh, and maybe we can thank, okay, thank you uh, for thank you. I think that would be yeah that would yeah that would be interesting to look at gender as well because through through my observation um. Uh, from my students, um, from my view, when I look at my students, uh, the female students are more resilient, I think. I think, but I did not do any research. So it would be very interesting if you also look at gender. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. That's a brilliant suggestion, Dr. Nick. <clears throat> what are some of the institutional factors? Can you name them that moderated um, your framework you, you you means are uh, other than what i have mentioned just now yeah uh, like so these are these the, are the the support from the from the university maybe their their portal or maybe their, their quality of uh, educator okay. or maybe the arrangement of timetable right sometimes also, I think that one also is very important. Maybe if like two pack, also the student like keep sitting in front of, of the computer, they also feel like very tired and very boring. So maybe. And correct me if I'm wrong. So these students are not uh, online students, but they were forced to be online because of the pandemic, correct? Yes. Ah, okay. Mm. Thank you. So these 300 something respondent, they, are, they already go through like almost one year or at least two semester or e-learning e -learning mode. So these are your first year students? No, some of them are second year already. 
second year. Mm. So okay. they, they can compare, they also can compare in between face-to-face -face and also e-learning. And, and do you compare domestic students and international students? Mm, not yet. This maybe future. In future, maybe I can compare. And, and most of your respondents were domestic students or international students? 100% uh, domestic students. Ah, okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Heng. Uh, Dr. Halima? Uh, I, this, this, uh, how long did it take for you to collect all this information? It's for this for this paper for this research three, three to four months three to four months mm. and the students that you used were all yours were they uh no some is from other 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 university or other college other colleges mm, yes. and did all these students they are using um, online learning did they have problem uh, acquiring the technology, the computers, the internet, and all that. Did you manage to research on that too? Yes, some of them like they have lack of the quality of uh, internet, so maybe like not so stable. Yeah. Um, and then some of them like their 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 computer spec are not up to up to up to the up to the par because like yeah, as, as I know Zoom. Zoom is like very high, high con consume our our RAM. So if like your RAM is not so stable, maybe your your, your screen or or the voice is not so clear on that. Because I when I started uh, teaching online, I was always worried about the capability of my students yes. in acquiring technology, because mm. some of them live in rural areas. It was. It was, uh, I always used to ask them, do you have, can you download this and all that? Because initially I didn't do a face-to-face -face online. It was allowed then by the university. I just mm. put up my lectures and then they had to download the lectures and read them. Yeah. I think it's very hard, especially when if you want to run like online exam, that one I think is not fair to the students who, who don't have the yeah. Full, full of full of the I mean the the criteria to to run the to, to, to learn online. But I I had my exams online. Oh. My exams were I, I recall giving them an online test, an open book online test. They had to be there and do their test online. But but I, I hope doctor you maybe you 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 make sure everyone is in the good Good condition. If if no, yeah. like not, not so fair to them, like 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 what, what do you say in, in the in the rural area, right? In the rural areas. Mm. I was all I was very worried about these students when we first began uh, online teaching. But now I think they, they've acquired everything and yeah. because technology isn't isn't cheap to acquire. Mm. And these students, most of them they they live on loans. So it was uh, very worrying when all this began. But I think it's good for them to go through this this period also because after that maybe they need to use for their their future career right maybe need to uh distant meeting or what right. Now, this this, yeah. this has uh, I realized that this has trained them uh in technology and for their for their career. Yes. No. But it's good it was it, the pandemic itself was. We declared emergency. The whole world declared emergency, and it it was quite quite, you know, problematic. It was very problematic yeah. in the beginning for all of us to yeah. to. We have technology as lecturers. We have technology, but the students. Okay, some of them live away from uh, cities and all that, and they had problems. But we managed to get over all that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank, Lima. Thank you for your research. Um, but, Doctor, um, maybe if, if you got any suggestion, you, you can email <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll <laughs> jot down your email. Do you have an email yes. that you can send me? Yeah, okay. 
I, I, okay. I got so on, on my screen. Can you, yeah, can you okay. put that in the chat, Mr. Okay. Han? Then Dr. Halima can just copy and paste. Yeah. Because I think this, this pandemic is not, not so far to come to the end. So I think e-learning we must, is, we must as a, from, from you, 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 university, we must do as well. So, I'm, so, I'm doing currently this type of research with my master's student. I have a master's by research student that's doing this kind of research. There you Thank go. you. Collaboration there. Well, Ang, you have got your hand up. Do you yes. want to? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jasvir. No um, problem. Yeah. It's uh, probably not a question, but uh, probably it's just some suggestion. But thank you, uh, Mr. Heng, for that uh, very good uh, presentation. Um, yeah. I was wondering whether do you control some of the confounding variables when you analyze the relationship? between uh, the variables that you looked at? Did you control for some confounding variables? No, I, I, I know I know got, got this kind of variable, so, but I am not doing this, uh, this control. Mm. Mm. Uh, why but, not? Yeah. Because you, you have not actually studied the other variables that might have uh, that might have some impact on student satisfaction. So uh, this is just a suggestion. If you can, then uh, it'll be also good to control some of the confounding variables so that you know that the variance explained will be purely, or most of them will actually come from the um, perceived usefulness and all that. Because many things will in fact will impact student satisfaction. So. Um, yeah, so this is just a suggestion. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think Ang, that it will also be very good for Mr. Hang because if he wants to publish the paper, then he yes. needs to explain, oh, isn't it? Yes. I, I'm not a quantitative person. I love yeah. my interviews, but I think you need to justify yes. like what yeah. Ang is saying. Yeah, and also to justify why do you choose facilitating conditions? only the three and not the rest, because there's a host of other facilitating conditions they may, they, that might mediate. Uh, that's why probably you just get a partial mediation. I mean, this is just my assumption, but it's okay. a good study. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ah. Yeah. I, 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 will, I will go, go further on that uh, confounding variables. Thank you. Any more questions about Mr. Hang? No? Okay, so we'll go to the, thank you so much, Mr. Heng, for your interesting you. presentation. What we're going to do now is we'll go to the last presenter, which is Dr. Nick. So Mr. Heng, can you please I uh, stop sharing your, so, and then uh, Dr. Nick, you can share your slides. And she will be presenting on teaching journal journalism in the era of disruptive change. And over to you, Dr. Ni. And Ang, can you please lower down your hand? Otherwise, I'll be thinking you need uh, to ask some questions. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's just a Zoom thing because I'm using this for my teaching. So I'm like, yeah, very thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> That's okay. okay. All right, Dr. Ni. Over to you. All right. All right. You know thank you. Yeah? So 20 minutes yeah. of presentation and then 5 10 minutes of question and answer. And we are done. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Jasby. Can you guys hear me clear? Okay, yeah. uh, right. Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Norma. I'm from School of uh, Communication, uh, University of Science Malaysia. The title of my uh, presentation today is on teaching journalism in the era of disruptive change. So what is journalism? Let me explain a little bit about journalism to our uh, audience. Yeah? Journalism uh, literally is activities uh, of gathering, assessing, and presenting news or information to the masses. So the purpose of journalism is actually to provide you, uh, the masses, with information that you need. Uh, and it has got to be ethically uh, presented to you so that you can make an uh, informed decision about your life and your family. So uh, we also, uh, journalism and media and journalism actually also uh, is called the fourth uh, estate in, in, uh, in, in a democratic countries whereby it is very powerful. Uh, it 
it look it's, it, 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 it is like a watchdog looking at what government has been doing and telling the people um, uh, about what are their plans and things like that so the 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 role is extremely very important so disruptive change actually uh, for example this digital uh, uh, era have brought uh, uh, change to media structure in Malaysia, particularly in Malaysia, uh, and the journalistic uh, practice as well. So if you were to see 15, uh, 20 years ago, media organizations actually not only producing and distributing information, but now they are also creating and curating. This is a new word, curating and competing content. Uh, long time ago, when people, uh, for example, take the mainstream newspaper like New Straits Time and The Star, they have different kind of information that they give to the masses but now they have very similar content and they competing with each other also they also compete with the netizen people like us because now everyone can be a journalist once you have your headphone you have media social media accounts you can just snap picture or take videos and put it up to your media accounts and and this media, media, social media can be accessed to everyone, uh, uh, and and they can share the likes button and sharing buttons actually make you literally a journalist because you can distribute your information what you put on your, on your uh, social media accounts uh, that been shared by people. So you actually can call yourself a, a journalist whereby. Uh, the, the the term that uh, people use now is um, a citizen journalist citizen journalism this is the the the, the new um, term uh, been used uh, the past eight ten years yeah so um this situation actually i'm trying to explain to you the situation how this situation make me think um because i'm teaching journalism for 10 years uh, after i finished my phd it, it made me think because the um, uh, this disruptive change have transformed the the media industry. Uh, it indirectly affected how we teach journalism, whereby it is it is not only that we are uh, we are pro producing uh, students graduates to for the industry. We also uh, try to more students to be thinker as well. Because journalism media is extremely very uh, powerful uh, medium, uh, so uh, this situation actually uh, give me some ideas and um, uh, to to do this research. Yeah, to do this research. Um, so I actually because of this situation, I started asking myself, why do I teach journalism when all people can be journalists? You know, uh, this this question have been in my head for like five years ago, six years ago, uh, and all this the the list that I put it here is these are the things that make me think. For example, the first one I've been teaching uh, ten years of uh, journalism. Within that span of ten years, I I can observe very different characters of a group of students that came into USM. If you were to see 10 years ago, people, uh, my students are very good in writing. They focus more on writing and language. So they try to uh, to um, to speak Bahasa Malaysia and English at least as, as good as they can. So slowly it changed. It changed to people who are more uh, like uh, tech savvy. They, uh, hold their handphones uh, 24 hours a day. When we teach, they did not pay attention. They just scroll their uh, social media and things like that. And second thing, when when we do curriculum reviews, for example, we we invited IAP, uh, that is industrial uh, panel uh, from outside. We invited them and we sit down academic and also media uh, practitioners. Uh, how what is the best to uh, to set up a good uh, uh, lesson, do uh, topics for uh, journalism students, and we, I always feel that we are always like uh, ten years backward from what uh, the 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 uh, the industry is having right now. In fact, I used to go to uh, to uh, to Thailand and also Indonesia, and uh, I have some collaboration. Uh, research and found that uh, even Thailand and Indonesia is far more um, 
uh, ahead of us. Yeah, uh, I will I will let you know what 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 is it. So and also when we did a staff accreditation and auditing, we are uh, within that ten years we had two audits whereby uh, the auditors will ask, uh, will will question how do you achieve uh, the OBE the learning outcomes and things like that because journalism is not, is not totally hundred uh, percent um, a theory thing it's very hands on and and things that you want to achieve is so um, so big you know because you are like serving the people. Uh, the, the the noble thing is that you are serving the people and you also have got to be a thinker it's not only like doing practical thing and also when my students go for internship for six months and um we have got to uh, ask the media industry what how did they do and things like that uh, it's always uh, uh, the industry always saying that there are a lot of uh, lacking in, in in the students uh um, uh, capabilities of writing news, uh, notes for news, trying to find news, and and giving back information, good information to the uh, to the um, to the masses. So these are all reflection that I did, uh, and all of this actually have a, a little bit uh, demotivated me at first uh, about five six years ago, but I I I kept going on because uh, when I go to class. Uh, I can see that uh, my students, these young people actually are so uh, motivated to learn journalism because of my student. My students actually uh, keep me uh, uh, going on, you know, uh, their expectation, their, uh, their noble uh, intention to be a good writer, to be to serve the masses. So, and also uh, the journal, journalistic, uh, journalistic uh, journalism ethics that I found for example, uh, there is a lot of fake news around. You know, people who are who are very irresponsible, like they just share whatever they they, they get. So that gives me some um, some motivation uh, to to teach uh, journalism in in a good way. So instead of like five six years ago, I have this question: Why do I teach journalism? Now it's changed to to so how do I teach journalism? You know, I have that, that uh, I have reason, I really have good reason to teach journalism. How do I teach journalism? Of course, there are a lot more other questions. For example, if I were to teach this way, uh, would, would it produce a good, uh, better journalist outside and for, for the masses especially and for the industry as well? So I have three uh, subjects that I teach uh, journalism. Um, journalism uh, section. I have newspaper publishing, uh, two, uh, uh, new media journalism and magazine production. Newspaper publishing and magazine production are very much hands on um, uh, uh, class classes, and new media journalism is more theory, theoretical and also hands on. So I chose two. I chose uh, newspaper publishing and magazine production. I, I I did uh, action research. This is my first time doing ex action research. And I want to see, I, I want to explore what is the best way for me to teach journalism. So uh, before we, we go on, uh, I in this presentation, I'm going to only talk about Rita Campus, that is newspaper pro uh, publishing too. Um, uh, the research that I I, uh, I did. So uh, let me explain a little bit. Uh, Britta Campus is newspaper campus uh, that we produce uh, six edition, six issues per semester every fortnightly. So students actually came up with Britta Campus. Britta Campus this year, um, uh, it, it is 50 years old for Britta Campus because it's first uh, produced in 1971. So it, it is. It was called Grassiswa before. So I want to show uh, something. The format when I started uh, teaching uh, journalism in 2010 and the innovation that I have done. So when I came back from PhD, uh, they have this printed newspaper. Uh, I introduced uh, to students to do advertisement to find advertisement so that uh, so that uh, they can uh, they they don't need to get. Uh, fundings from USM or from the school so that the students understand uh, doing a uh, greater campus doing when you go out and work uh, in the newspaper you also have to look at the revenue of the of the of the media uh, that you produce so uh, 
after 2012, I found that uh, newspaper printing, it costs a lot. It costs a lot when we want to print because students are selling it for five, 50 cents. Okay, students are selling it at 50 cents and it costs a lot and we don't have enough uh, money at that time. So I proposed to the school to come up with web, web page so that uh, we put it on our website and people can have a look at it. So I did a test design in 2013 and then it went well, it went well. Uh, but uh, the people who are reading it, it uh, is decreasing at that time. So I, uh, between uh, around 2016, I found that uh, at that time, because we also already have Instagram and uh, a lot more multi-platform uh, media social. So I actually uh, try to teach students uh, mobile journalism. Mobile journalism meaning that you use your mobile, you interview people, you write your you write your um, berita news uh, there and then and you pass it on to editors at that time it was me, pass it on to me and I will edit it and, and uh, within like uh, 45 minutes, it will come out to the newspaper. Because at that time in 2016, people are competing for time. Uh, we don't wait 24 hours for publishing. We, we publish uh, good ethical news uh, within like one hour. So uh, after, the, the green color mini that is very successful at that time and then I suggested uh, teaching uh, to the school to teach multi-platform vertical writing meaning that you write for 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 the web page you write for the printed and you write for the social media so the way of writing is called vertical writing is is different it's different even though the content is the same so um in 2018, I introduced visualization because at that time visualization is very important, like infographic, like we have we have here uh, in COVID-19, we use infographic. And then uh, in 2021, uh, I introduced interactive uh, using data, uh, like what uh, we are having right now. We use data and use infographic uh, and a little bit of write-up. And I also taught students how to do curation. Uh, because they could not go out and interview people. So they have got to rely on internet and uh, curate the news. So, uh, and also I teach a uh, personalization. Personalization is extremely important. Allow me to explain a little bit about personalization. For example, if USM wants to rebrand our, our, our university, we use uh, three types of media. Uh, one is online, one is TV, uh, one is social media. So we we have opportunity to rebrand our university. Like we use the tagline, we lead. Uh, at the same time, we get a personality from USM. For example, uh, people who have done a lot of research, uh, our vice chancellor, we 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 put them uh, on TV. For example, that is for engagement and also. Uh, in the end, we have uh, we have got to do marketing strategy, and it has got to be uh, to be uh, to go on for a certain period of time. Uh, the best way to do it is in social media. You see, if you are a journalist, the way you write in here and the way you produce here and here, uh, it is called vertical vertical um, vertical writing, which is a different writing altogether. Okay, uh, so my question for this research is how to teach journalism in the era of disruptive change. I, I use action research uh, to identify problem, uh, develop a plan, action, evaluate, evaluate it, and to provide suggestion because in the end, I would like to gather info to implement change in practice. So uh, this, this research is done in, uh, in, uh, in 11 weeks from 29 March 2020. 20th of June uh, in the class, online class, unfortunately, with 26 journalism students, uh, 25 of them are female students, one male students. Okay, so the, the action research model that I have, I did two cycles. Uh, I use, uh, I plan the action and then implement it, analyze it, and then I have this feedback and I, I amend it a little bit and then I go, I go go once again with the students so this is what uh, i did uh, so uh, framing the problems actually not only looking at the, the uh, observing the students but i also have got to take care uh, take into account the covid 
19 uh, issues because I could not do it in, in class face to face. I've got to do it uh, online. So maybe there is a pro and cons to that. What I found that is uh, this is the age of conflict. When you talk about disruptive change, it, it is the age of conflict. It is not altogether negative. It's not altogether uh, positive, but you have got to adapt yourself to to this situation. I'm focusing only on journalism, journalism student and journalism study. Uh, so uh, uh, it started with the internet and then social media the past 10 years is really like uh, affect uh, the, the feel of journalism because it affect the media structure. So uh, looking at not looking at the industry, but looking at university, we need to stay relevant. You know, we, we, we need to stay relevant as I mentioned, but what we uh, did not realize is that we only relate ourselves with the industry. But the most important thing, thing go back to the noble notion of, of journalism, is how do we serve the readers and viewers? And we also, um, in the middle of, uh, in the midst of, of news um, uh, world, yeah. So uh, the ethical issue is extremely important. So these these are the things that. Um, um, I need to address in my in my class. So what should be thought? Yeah, what should be thought? Um, the question that came up uh, in my head is that does specialization in communication study is relevant because we have publishing, we have journalism, we have broadcasting, we have public relation. Is it is it necessary to have only like one standalone uh, specialization or should we combine it together? And is it is journalism still relevant? Uh, do we understand that? Are we serving media industry or are we serving the masses actually because thinking uh, uh looking at this it, it can help to to uh, mold uh, the content and stuff so the the next question is that how can it be taught how journalism how can i teach journalism so i from the first and second uh elements i found that it is extremely important to come up with digital literacy skill content creator and curator we are not content seeker we create yeah uh, and ethical uh, elements, uh, ethical and also be a digital resilient. Because when I talk about uh, social media today, uh, I bet maybe two weeks, two months, or maybe one year or two years, we will get another thing uh, because technology is so fast. Yeah. So uh, I also will not uh, will not uh, look at myself when I want to develop this. I also look at my student. What are their expectations? Because uh, they are the one who who suggest me, who give me ideas to do this research, and are they ready to embrace digital change? Because they are uh, digital babies, uh, digital babies. Uh, so, so uh, I, I want to know further. So this is this is the action that I did. Uh, the planning action I I I uh, I propose interactive experimental class. Uh, I try to be brave enough. Uh, students are encouraged to design their class schedule, what they want to learn. But I showed them the OBE, the objective and the learning outcome. You have got to tailor what you want to study with that OBE. So I teach them about OBE. I teach them about the learning outcome. I heard, I hear what they want actually, how they can uh, mold their learning process and then I can achieve the, uh, the, the OBE and things like that. But it's all uh, with my guide. So I suggested doing Mojo, uh, mobile journalism, visual storytelling, experimenting uh, out a layout and alternative style, uh, style newspaper. All this uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, these aims actually, to understand this. Uh, so after that, when I analyze and evaluating action, uh, I found that people are more engaged uh, in class activities, uh, more participative and interactive, but they are yet to be proactive. They are still feel very shy and afraid to do uh, experiment, you know. So reflecting on the action, uh, interactive and two-way communication is really vital. Uh, I understand more what they want, what their needs and capability. Engagement also creates creativity. So the feedback that I, I got when we discussed, students are active social media users, very active, but they are not content creators. Uh, that is the lack. Uh, and they also lack of understanding on ethical journalism. So I did the 
uh, second uh, cycle where I, I use the same method, interactive experimental cl class, but at this time they have a control of the whole thing 100%. Uh, so that because we already have the feedback so that you based on feedback so you you suggest me. so in this impl uh, implementing action i did data journalism creation and personalization to aim uh, to to look at this one a uh, content creator and creator with ethics whether they understand or not so creation gets more um, students engagement especially when i use it with data and they also pay high interest in doing personalization they are more uh, uh, uh understand they are not shy anymore because they have done the first cycle so the need uh but the need to instill journalistic value system news literacy and skill to do assignment across uh, media platform need to be uh, need to be uh, focused on so small conclusion after i finish this teaching journalism across media multi-platform uh, with ethics is extremely important in general so evaluation uh, it is important to to uh, expose the student with real media news uh, room situation, even though it's only online, and producing content with ethics across multi platform. Not only they need to have a writing skill, but how to write in different uh, platforms. So, a uh, vertical writing should be taught to suit the different media platform. It is called transmedia ideation, and journalism is no longer an area of specialization that stands alone. It is not. Uh, the convergence of media due to advancement of technology has transformed its nature and it blends with other uh, areas such as broadcasting and public relations so no longer journalism journalism but it broadcast journalism uh, interactive experimental class where technically students actually run their own class creates high engagement uh, and encourage students to be more particip participative despite this technology students also also should learn about journalistic value system uh, with idealism and skepticism. Um, this is the evaluation that I found in action. So suggestion, I would uh, suggest that uh, modification be done um, in, in this uh, uh, journalism uh, course, uh, no more boundaries of specialization in media studies. Uh, we should go for convergent journalism and engagement with media industry and public is extremely important. Not to say that uh, we have got to follow the industry, but uh, we have got to, um, to work together. Uh, so I, based on this research, actually, uh, I suggested to the school to, to propose a new, uh, new subjects, for example, for example, ethics and fact checking, uh, data storytelling using data and uh, tell your story, news production multi platform, interactive visualization. If you watch Malaysia Kini, that is the best for me, that is the best um, uh, media that you can learn interactive visualization and transmedia ideation. So these are the things that uh, you, you need to uh, to explore. So conclusion, journalism is still relevant, uh, but major modification needs to be done. They should, uh, they should not be boundaries of specialization in media studies. Teaching journalism is not entirely about technology. It's not, it's not actually. And digital skill alone, but journalis journalistic value system values, we still need to be human. And ethic must be instilled as well. So best basic journalistic practice such as good writing skill and good command of language are still at the core uh it's still very important so uh thank you very much oh thank you so much dr nick that was so interesting presentation from you uh any other question any questions for to dr nick I really like that you partner with your students because there is a concept of student as partners uh, where we are now um, striving for in my institution. And this is one of the a perfect example where you partner with your student in, in creating uh, the curriculum, not for them, but also for you. And you should publish this, yeah. please. you will get traction. <laughs> please. Please publish your work. Okay. Dr. Halima, yes? Yeah. Um, it, this is a very interesting presentation because I, I was a student in that faculty to when I was at university. I 
was doing my minor in public relations and used to buy this Bristol campus. Ah, oh. <laughs> okay. In those days. And I would like to, I would like you to explain to me this, this, this thing that you talk about. Uh, creator and content creator and curator with ethics. Can you explain that to me? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Halima. Uh, that is yeah. a very good question because a lot of people like confuse what is uh, content creator and content uh, curation actually. Content curator meaning that uh, meaning that you actually because you could not get it, uh, go go outside your house to interview people, for example. So you actually find your sources from internet, okay, from internet. So you curate you curate the the information. But of course, I always tell my students, when you curate uh, information, you have got to give credit to all these people who, who publish uh, that information, be it uh, individuals or uh, media web page or, or um, a formal, like KKM formal uh, 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 website. You have got to give credit and you should not give your name as writer. But you have got to credit all these people because if you were to read newspaper, sometimes they will they will uh, put uh, like title and byline. Nick Norman, Nick Hassan. You should not. It should not be that way. Curation is taking this information because students cannot get out to get uh, news. They can do that. Yeah, you you uh, students uh, did uh, 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 write up on vaccination, for example, and you should not put your name. Um, and student did not. Uh, know that because when you put your name as if you are the one who who do it but you did not do it you just take from uh, the star and you need to uh, you could not take a cut and paste uh, information you have got to um, Allah, yeah? you have got to uh, rewrite it yeah rewrite it and then you have got to cite that is the star you cannot put your name. You have got to explain that is a curation. There's a lot of ethical issue when I read uh, a lot of uh, web uh, web uh, page yeah, uh, that they claim that they are uh, content cr creator and curation. Uh, it, that is not true. Content creator is actually you you go and find uh, on your own on your own, you create that uh, information, you create that information. And normally that information is not, you could not find it. This happened eight years ago in, in the US, you could not find it anywhere. Uh, for example, um, uh, news about vaccination, news about vaccination is always come from, uh, for example, KKM uh, or the government or, 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 or doctors, but you can also get uh, views of people on vaccination. If you were to ask about uh, to my parents, at first they don't want, they refuse to get vaccinated, you know, uh, things like that. Why don't you do, this is a uh, thing out of the box. Uh, take a few people, elderly, for example, and uh, uh, give um, these people voice, you know, uh, why didn't they want to get vaccinated? That is creator. Uh, creator is not creation. A lot of people thought that they pick up all the all the information from the internet and they claim that they are creator. It, that is not the correct way. Uh, so human for me, humanized journalist journalism students is still is still uh, the core. Um, ethics is still the core. We don't, we don't steal information from people because we know internet, nobody knows uh, who steal our information unless it becomes viral, you know, suddenly, suddenly it becomes viral and then only I know, wow, this is my information. I put it in my web page, you know, uh, things like that. So you have got to differentiate creator and creation. You have no right to put your name if you put, uh, you, you do cur uh, cur curation. You have no right, yeah. But right. you you still you can still help the masses to understand certain things, yeah. So you combine the information. Yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah, like I do my lecture notes. I take uh, a lot of information from journals and all that, and from the internet too. But when I put it onto the slides, I normally uh, put the title and the author first and the web page after that 
the information. So is that the way to do it or because I, I normally feel sometimes I feel bad about it, you know, <laughs> because I didn't know that the term was curating. Ah, oh, okay. okay. Uh, but if you like present that to only students, uh, a group of close uh, uh, people, a group of uh, students, for example, I have like uh, 26 students. Uh, so what I did uh, for this group, I definitely uh, will put their names and journal articles and at the back of, uh, at the end of the slides, I will list all the references so that yeah, they are even yeah. known. I did not take it. I it's not my idea actually. So uh, they are in the know. Normally, I will in our course outline. I have already listed the major uh, publication uh, that I I refer to, and also the additional one. And from time to time, I also collected the, like like from a journal article where I will put it in my uh, slides actually. So it is a group of people, a uh, small group of people. So that's all right, I think. But this is masses, and sometimes it becomes viral, you know. So yeah, this is but, this is a lot of issues. But what we do is we acknowledge the source that we take the lectures yeah. from. We and, have got to acknowledge, yeah. yeah. And normally I put uh, the last slide is references. I yeah. normally put down all the references that I've used for the lectures, yeah. but I didn't know that the term was curating. <laughs> If you were to ask me, uh, I might be wrong, yeah. Um, but when it comes to like lecture, like what we are doing, uh, it is not very much curation. Uh, the, one of the criteria for curation is it's 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 known to it's distributed to the masses, like uh, okay. big, yeah, big uh, crowd, you know, and they are they actually are able to share. And they are able to make it viral, so that that is curation. Yeah. If if I put it in a simplistic manner, like our literature review in our paper, that is curation, kan? And then our findings is content creator. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that's good. That's good, Doctor Jasbe. That's good. That's good. I'm a yeah. student. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm yeah. looking at, at journalism, journalistic world, and mm. and yeah, that's good. That in in academic, that is that it is, that mm. it is, yeah. But like Dr. Yes. Aima, you did systematic review, kan, just now. So that is curator. Yeah. So that's you right. are yeah collecting yeah and data. Yep, yep. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. But Dr. Ni, please, 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 la, I will try. Publish this paper. I will so try. Look, look up student as partners concept. And yeah. there is a, a, a journal dedicated for this. Uh, it's by Kelly Matthews. You will you will definitely get accepted there. If okay. you need more information, okay. just email and I'll give you all the information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jasbe. That no would be good. Problem. No problem. Because this is this is such a very innovative method that you have taken and 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 you 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 did this research. You you should you know hike up about this. Hmm. And and Kalabule apply for fellowship of higher education advance because I think this this is uh, this is married. This this oh. this research has got married and what you are doing, you know that that the flow that you have done in ten years, what you are doing as an educator should be recognized. Mm. And if you need more information on that, I can give it to you as well. Yeah, I will write to you, Dr. Jasper. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please, I, 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 I definitely will pass on the information. Thank you. No problem, Dr. Ning. I think we have got two more minutes. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, we'll close this session. And you can um, have the liberty to go to other sessions because I believe yeah. there are more presentations uh, going on there. Yes. Um, any other questions? All right, kalau tak ada, if none, um, I let you go, and um, I'll see you soon. And thank you very thank much. You for Dr. Halima, thank you, uh, Dr. Jasbi. Oh yeah, one moment one. Dah. Can we one have a group any... photo? Yeah, oh, okay. if you can. Can if you, you can on the camera? Yeah, if you can on. I will on my on. camera too. <laughs> Mr. Hang, Ang, Dipa, Yuni. If not, I will take the screenshot. Okay, smile. One, two, three. Cheese. One more. One more. 
Okay, smile. One, two, three. Thank you all. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Puan Raini, for Thanks helping Thanks a lot, Jasmine. Ah, nanti Han jangan lupa. Han main pin aku belanja. Ah, mesti dah. Ah, oh, Han jangan lupa. <laughs> aku tak lupa, insyaAllah. Bye, Jasmine. Okay, so it means dah habis dah eh. Dah oh. saya tak ada apa-apa tugas dah, ya? Yep. Boleh masuk Alright. sesi yang lain kalau masih nak join kita pun nak hmm. take a break, solat sekejap. Ha, Nanti ni pun dah dapat. pukul pukul 4 dah. Ya, aku dah aku dah letih lah. Eh, tidur dulu sekejap. <laughs> Betul lah. Weh, recording weh. Recording. Stop this. Alright then.